but this doesn't look clean to me. This looks choppy. Like sellers obviously came in, they're strong. And, and you know, like even this, it's like, the, it's got like that wedge look to it. It doesn't have- On shorting stock, losing one art doesn't exist. Like this is one thing you have to understand. You lost your lockout or you didn't. Like as shorter term traders and not investors, like we're just, we're in the rental business. We're not in, we're not in like the, the owning business. Before getting the video, just a quick reminder that this is not financial advice. And I'll also link all the tools I personally use to trade down in the description. So don't forget to check that out. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. One thing that I was thinking that we could talk about is I think that too many retail traders, especially when they go on social media, they they try to just emulate like small cap shorting. It just seems like that's what most of retail does because that's those are the people that you know show the big P and Ls, and it just it's not a strategy that works for everyone. You know, it just like it, the strategy has to fit your personality. Yeah, it, ha but it, it has to fit your person. Like you have to find a trading style that fits your personality, you know, and maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I'm done to talk about it because that's something I absolutely did not touch once in the past, I guess, four months. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but you haven't touched it in three months. How do you feel? Do you feel stressed because you're, you know, you're not fighting, you're not fighting the trend. You're not going against everyone. And like, just because like you see people on Twitter, like most likely posting fake charts or, or whatnot, right? Like. We can start there, but I I don't feel stressed. I feel like my stress level definitely went down, like drastically. And there's just like I still have bad days that I just overtrade and do stupid stuff. But it just doesn't feel, or not it doesn't feel, but I don't take like massive losses. And for me, like a shorting stock, like always puts me on tilt, even if it's like a a large cap or a mid cap. Like I'm very prone to make massive mistake when I'm on the short side. I don't know why. I think it is because the theory goes that the higher it gets, the better short it is. Because if you were thinking it was a good short at, let's say, four dollars, and now it's at eight, it's better because you were thinking it was a short at four. Now it's at eight, so the the reward is it gets bigger. But there's this kind of inverse correlation that the higher it goes the higher it keeps on going because now everybody's thinking the same thing and for me i mean i took i probably gave back roughly half of everything i made in 2023 shorting day one and it was like it wasn't on like not just shorting day one just shorting stuff that are just going up way too much you know when it looks just so good on on you look at a chart it looks beautiful it looks like a perfect short but timing it is just so hard. And I drew down literally like 80% of my year just trying that specific setup. So avoiding it hasn't made me more PL yet, but I think it just avoided me some downside for the moment. And um, I think it came after talking to you when I was in New York that like, I, or actually talking with a few guys there that it just saw that like people were actually doing other things and you don't have to do only that. And it was a good, it was a good, not advice, but good thing to see because I did take a step back and just kind of like take it, took everything and just put it in the trash. I'm not sure if it's, if it was the right thing to do, but I literally went on this thing of like, I don't want to trade any setup that I used to trade before and just trying to find a fully new playbook. That's, I don't have this, like this risk of ruined that much. Uh, that's was it because I would go on like a three months of like good trading and then one day I would lose literally everything I made. Even if you have a stop loss, you, you hit one day you're going to max lock. The next day you're going to hit the same thing. Then you're on tilt, you trade bad. And like it just, um, you're not tilting, but it's just your mindset or your your brains, you lose confidence and it just keeps on doing mistake and mistakes. So this one big loss, it just compounds into even more losses until there's like a home run that you hit and then you're able to slowly grind back up a hole and then the next one comes in and it just shoots you back in a hole. So so yeah, my stress level went down. My PL hasn't increased yet, but I haven't had like one day that just ruined like a, a week or something like that. That decent loss, but nothing that um ruins my day let's put it this way i'll still be frustrated but i won't be like you know just going in my bed at 2 p.m just saying like oh what did i do like why did i do that yeah you know i never really got into this shorting small caps game uh you know the prop firm that i started at 
when I when I started, our locate system was terrible, you know. Um, and a lot of those things just happened to be hard to borrow or restricted. You know, it was it just wasn't a game that they thought that they had edge in. Uh, you know, the older traders, so they never really looked into it. And it, it wasn't really something that they improved on until apparently after I left when they when they got more locates. Um, it's just funny. It's funny to me that so many people seem to find shorting small caps. And I don't know if it's because, you know, like your uh, social media personalities, I don't want to name any names, but you know, very prominent social media personality who shorts penny, penny stocks. And, you know, he's told his story and, you know, I'm sure everyone can figure out who that is. And then from that, it just seems that there's more and more short, chat rooms that looking to short small caps and i'm not you know there's obviously chat rooms that go long too but i think that the ones that seem seemingly always are posting on twitter or social media and you know you obviously have to take it with a grain of salt because who knows if it's a paper account who knows if it's a demo account who knows if they're who knows if they're short in one account and long in another and then they're only showing one account right I, you know i i these are things that I, I've learned to not put past people as I've gotten to know more people in the industry, but it's just such a hard strategy. Like, I, I mean, I understand that people, especially now people are becoming more data centric and they're running numbers and they're trying to figure out, well, it, you know, don't short on day one, but you short on day two or three or day four. Um, I know people that like to go long on day three because that's when like, that's when the short, that's when it's the shorts all get called in. You know, so they're looking, they're looking to go long on day three instead. Um, you know, and we talked, we touched upon this last week a little bit, uh, just about, you asked a question about the failure rate of trading. I spent the week thinking about this and I think a lot of people fail because they don't find a strategy that works for their personality. And, you know, and we've talked about this and as you were just saying, just because a lot of people are successful doing something doesn't mean that you're going to find success doing that same thing, right? I've found more success slowing down my time frames, taking, taking away those HFTs, taking away those little niche trades. Um, it's been really hard for me because I know that I still have friends that are finding success in like very quick success, whether it's trading breaking news, whether it's trading, um, some sort of imbalance or some sort of, um, like spike, uh, or like, even if it's a scalping strategy where you, you know, you're looking at your one minute charts and the level two, just like every other small cap trader and you're, and you're finding that quick move, um, you know, today is Valentine's day. So, you know, BMR made a quick $2 up move this morning, right? If you're things like that, where, you know, oh, if I can just time it right, I can get that quick money and that, you know, and, and that quick profit, right? But for me, as I've gotten older, I've realized that I need to be more analytical and thoughtful in my trading. And I need to use longer time frames to kind of take away some of that noise. And, you know, just recognizing that for me, I've really learned that the trend is your friend, right? Um, I'd rather be long something like a ARM arm a couple of days ago went from 125 to 160. And I know people that were trying to short it and they lost a lot of money. I know people that were trying to short lift yesterday in after hours from 12 to 20 and they lost a bunch of money. To me, it's, just, it's, it's like you said, it's, it's so hard finding the top, but it's like a male macho ego thing, right? Like to say like, I found, I found the top, I found the, or I found the bottom, right? If anything, I'd rather try to find the bottom, right? Because at least, you know, there's at some point there's gonna be value to something, but on the way up, you have no idea how far, how far something will go. Right. And I don't care what people say. It's always hindsight. Well, I drew this line across the chart or I, you know, I did this, right. It, yeah, of course, it's so easy to say in hindsight and, and you're probably trading a hundred shares, you know, and, and you have 27 executions on the chart with your little DAS arrows and it's probably 10 share lots, you know, maybe it's more, right? I mean, I'm not trying to put anyone down here. hundred right? share lots, hundred share lots, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, right. It doesn't matter what it is, right. Everyone, you know, but the fact that so many people are pointing out those types of trades, like, like everyone can't be profitable making all those trades all the time. Right. And, and to your point, those people that are, 
yeah, 95% of the time they're going to be right. And that one time blows them up. The one time blows out three months worth of profit. It just, it's such a dangerous, you know, double-edged sword that they're, they're kind of like, you know, teetering on of, of risk or ruin basically, in my opinion. Well, I mean, I got into trading because I saw a lot of people shorting stock, but I didn't get access to like borrows. So I tried a long at first and then I switched to more like a long swing because this was the, I mean, I guess it was 2020, 2019. And I, I just landed on Crow Maggie. So I was like, oh, this seems so smart. And it was a point, the moment I found him and the strategy made sense because things were going up and it was just like, you know, things were going up. So I was either trying to swing, but I was re restricted with buying power, margin, all that stuff. But I was just taking these trades intraday, right? Like looking for like these simple strong arm would, would have been uh, a perfect, like a setup of something I would have focused on back then. And it reminded me of a lucid. Um, I can't bring it now on chart on, I can't bring the chart now, but it was in 2021 or 2020. It is when it broke out of that massive base. It was the exact same chart. I remember it very well, but these were all my biggest trade, but then the strategy kind of faded away. So then I found myself just, you know, finding the next thing to do, which was shorting. And it made sense. It made sense for a bit, but it, it feels, I don't know, it's so cyclical and you have to be so in tune on which one you can short, which one you can short. And I think that some people are very good at finding these, like, they're not like, they're not special, but these opportunity with like, I don't like to call it like outside risk reward, but just the one that have less potential of like, you know, ruining you. But over the long run, they still take like massive beating. And it's when you're posting just charts on Twitter, it seems like they're always off on these specific days that, you know, everybody gets like, you know, the best way to see it is every time there's something that runs a thousand, thousand percent is the new average. So a thousand percent intraday. Nobody lost or people took like a one R one R loss. I love you. I only lost one R. How like I only lost one R really, but it's like, do you really size all your trade exactly the same? You never had slippage, you know, it's like, what's, what is this on shorting stock? Losing one R doesn't exist. Like this is one thing you have to understand. <laughs> You lost your lockout or you didn't. Because if you try it once, it keeps on going up. You're going to try something. Or if something else starts running, you're going to try that one also. Because that's your strategy. Every time something runs, you're supposed to short it. I don't know why it got popular. I think it's because on Twitter, that's really what it is. And the point that gets confusing is the chat room now. Like the, every new chat room is about shorting low float day one or even multi-day. Some of them call them their, their specialized trader. I only wait for day two or day three. Well, like, you know, but they still trade day one sometimes. Like, it's so I'm like, so now there's probably, I don't know, how many long chat rooms do you know about? How many long chat rooms do I know? Um, there's definitely there's definitely a couple. Um, On the small, small cap, I mean. Yeah, there's there's a couple. I mean, there's definitely a couple that I know, that I know of that are, are very good. Um, you know, I'm not going to mention any names. There's also, the, what you have to be cautious of, though, is that there's also a lot that are just, pumpers right that there's they're blatant pumpers and they're definitely getting long and selling you selling into their their members buying right and i think that's that's the dangerous part of, of all this and that's why then the the short sellers come out and say well you know that's just a blatant pump and dump yeah and they're just shorting them right it's a pump and dump chat room right there's a you know um there's another there was another prominent chat room guru that was in during that 2020 2021 who was long, you know long only right who was going on youtube every morning at nine o'clock and he was already long and you know all the short chat rooms that i you know follow or people that i talk to they're like oh he's he's in it he's in it you know just wait till he wait till he starts dumping to his sheep and then the, then the top's in the short's in it's a, it's a liquidity cr creating event right like you're creating all this extra liquidity when all these other retail people are getting long, ex extended from a base, right? And, or, you know, up, up a thousand percent, right? And then someone's thinking the same thing, like, or what you're saying, I, it's up, it's up 800%, but a thousand percent is the new, the new thing. I can make that next 200%, right? Like, 
and and then the same thing to the shorts right like then well it, it, it can't go a thousand percent again right another one's going to go to a thousand percent it's it's going to do that again no way you know it's a short it, yeah it's a really interesting dynamic but you know it it's still just really strange to me that all those guys seem to win all the time because all the prop traders i know they don't win all the time like they're not winning all the time i don't win all the time like my my win rate is, is abysmal right my win rate's below 50 percent but as long as i'm keeping my risk to reward in line you know i try to keep it above two to three two or three to one making sure that i have leave room for that five to ten to twenty r trade you know the, these people on twitter just showing that this, they're, they're constant winners is just it's it's mind-boggling and, it, and it's just it's you know it's frustrating and right and even as a prop trader you know it really weighs on your confidence of who you are and, and like what you're doing and how you're doing things just like well should I be doing that? You know, is, is that what I should be doing? Is that how I should be doing these things? Like, you know, am, what am I doing wrong that I'm not doing it that way? And, it, and it's seemingly, quote, you know, so easy for them to do it that way, right? But, you know, back to my original point of this whole talk is that it just doesn't fit my personality. And it took me a long time to realize that, you know, it took me a long time to realize that I it's just not for me, you know, and that and that's and it, I lost so much money trying to figure out, figure that out and learn that. But, you know, and, and now I and now I just I know to stay away. Right. And then I found strategies that speak to me that for you, like you'll figure out and that you can add that P&L back, you know, add, you know, add, add the gains that you did have back to to like your overall P&L. I mean, when I did the, the transition before we move out of, of topic to like not shorting anymore, it's my best trades were always the day two gap ups, like something that I ran so much. And then, you know, um, ideally gapping up had like a strong push. And then I would look, you know, to get on the backside just before it makes a new high. And then you show the new backside. But this, <laughs> but the issue that I had with that is, uh, this strategy used to be like a frequency of, um, I would say twice a month, three times a month. So I would technically flatline the whole month or like, you know, day one shorting, I would make a bit of money. Then I would lose it the next day. I would make a bit the next day. Then I would lose it again. And then when these came around, I was able to bet big and like, you know, had a good month just on these. But the turning point was really that these just stopped happening for for a long, I guess, a long time, a few months. But that's enough for you to start just grinding shares and, and be quickly in a drawdown. And and then, like, you know, a few months and then another couple months, and it, it just never came back. We, we're starting to have these, like, you know, day one that, that went up, to, I think it was TPSD, something like 2,500%. On, uh, it just went up so much. And but they all died on day one. So even if they went up a lot, they never gapped up and continued. So so I was just there, still wanted to click because I'm someone that's always been fighting over trading. And I think it's rare that some it's rare that traders don't have this like itch of trading because you're just sitting at your screen. There's so much stimulation. There's news. You hear this quack. There's a chart. There's something hitting your scanner. Something's getting halted. And like to just be there and not trade anything. Like it was just, it was hard. So I was just, you know, getting, that's why I was just getting out of my playbook. And I was like, I was debating at this point now, um, if I should bring it back, but the frequency is so low that maybe it's worth it, maybe not. And I could still move along from all the other strategy, but I'm scared that if I go back to kind of this one, it's going to just put me back in that game of really tracking all these runners, all these movers and then it's like, oh, but maybe it's going to go up because now I'm more long biased. So now I'm conflicting between, oh, should I look for a short? Should I look for a long? So I'm like, it's like a Pandora box that you open up. Like you think it's just, you're just going to put back this setup in your playbook, but it's a whole Pandora box of problem that you bring along with that, that setup. It's so emotional. One of the things, one of the things that I really struggled with in my old firm is, you know, I was taught to trade anything and everything, right? If, if something's moving, you should be looking to find a trade in it because but it's take, it took me a long, long time to realize that that all volatility isn't created equal, right? So just because something's volatile and moving doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to find something where you can manage your risk based on your personality, right? And to your point, like I, 
I would be long, short, long, short. You'd see that like one little, that one minute range, right? The one little range. It's like, it, it's, it's, say it's putting a lower high, right? So it's up, down, and it's kind of going sideways now. And, and it's putting in a lower high, like, oh, well, this could break out or this could be the stuff backside, backside move. So all of a sudden, I'll, and I'm, you're watching the level two, you're seeing bids come in and offers come in and people paying and hitting. And, and I'm doing both of it, right? Trying to go with what I think is the, the next momentum move. And all of a sudden I'm down three, five, six, seven thousand dollars and, and the stock's still in the same 50 cent range. You know, and it's and I'm the one paying and hitting the spreads because I'm trying to play momentum and I didn't have a strategy for it, right? Like I'm it's it was moving, it was in play, and it's 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 extended from the one minute moving averages and it's above VWAP. So yeah, it could retrace down to those areas, but it could also break out and go make the next that hundred percent move on the upside, right? And then half the time I finally catch that move only just to become back back to break even. And I'm like, well, that was like a waste of a day, and now my stress levels through the roof and now I need to go have a couple beers with my buddies and it just like, you know, and it, it's the whole the whole day was a waste, right? Um it, yeah, like like that that just style of trading is just like you said, it just it's so stressful and like I you know, and I know people that still do it and some people do really well and some people get caught in like ZJYL. Um I think that game is just for me it's just changed a lot because now there's all these volatility halts, limit up, limit down halts. And it just changes. Like before all those halts came into play it was easier because you didn't have to worry about those halts be stuck in a halt and then you have to sit there and wait for the halt to reopen well is it going to halt and open up or is it going to halt and open down you know they tend to go in the same direction but not all the time sometimes you know there was one the other day that i was watching uh maybe h-o-l-o and where it had limit up and then I don't, I don't remember. I, I think it, I think it was HOL and then, and then it went through its five minute halt ban, but say it halted at like 20, just for, I don't know the numbers. I don't want to misspeak, but just say it was 20 and then it opened up at 1850. Right. So it was a limit up halt. So if you're long, right, if you're long into that limit up halt, all of a sudden it opens up and so you just lost a dollar 50 without even trying to lose a dollar 50, right? Like if you had sized into that halt, trying to risk your, 50 cents, right? Your $500, right? A thousand, a thousand shares, $500. And now all of a sudden you took a three R loss just because of the people playing games with the halt and the imbalance and trying to really screw with people, you know, screw with retail traders or, you know, even prop traders, because my friends are trading these things, just screw with traders. Whoever's controlling the stock is screwing with, screwing with everyone at that point. And now, now everyone has to try to figure out like, well, is this just a buy opportunity because it's where it broke out from? Or is this like, well, that was like a big old F you. And now this is like, this is a short opportunity. And now you're just, like you said, just you're getting conflicting signals again. And it's just like, all right, wh why am I even bothering doing, why am I even doing this anymore? <laughs> you know, why am I in, why am I in this for the stress of not being able to control the risk that I want to control, right? Yeah, that's that could actually bring out um, the next subject, which was a trade I took on VZIO. So I got in at literally the top. I saw the news headline. I tried to get in on the news because, you know, the headline was really good. It was like a, a company looking to get bought out by Walmart or Walmart looking to buy out this company. So I knew it was a, like a legit, it came from a legit source and all of that. But the thing on my news feed, it came with the ticker Amazon. So for some reason, it, so the headline was Walmart looking to buy uh, this company, but then I had to open the filing quickly just to see the ticker. And then it put me the, just, you know, a little bit on the backside of the trade because I wasn't fast enough to get in into the halt. I was, I, I tried, but it, it was just, it was getting halted. So I, I couldn't do anything. And then because it opened up so fast, like the one minute candle we saw, we see after the halt, it didn't look or feel like it actually printed for one minute. It looked like it just flashed and then the stock tried to go next limit up. And this is why I technically try to get in because I was like, oh, if it, like, I'm sure if there's funds off guard and this looking to at a buyout, I'm like, it could help twice in a row. I mean, with the, the gap that it did, I'm like, I wouldn't be surprised that there would be a more, more squeeze or something like that. But if fake halted, 
and talking about halt, it just slammed back down like right away. So I try to, I just had to exit on this, like on this down move and I try to buy it again and again and again. Do you think after the halt, there's any edge left or you think that the halt was the trade? Um, so, so I think there's a couple of things that you're missing here and, and maybe you thought about these things and just didn't say them yet. Um, okay. So I looked up the headline just cause I didn't, I didn't see this trade and, and the headline that I see on my news had my news scanner Vizio sur- surges on a report that Walmart is in talks to buy them for more than 2 billion. All right. And that came out at, at, at 309. Um, so, so during this halt, you can kind of see, all right, now, you know, so if you don't have a Bloomberg terminal, right? So people have Bloomberg terminals or news scrapers or whatever it is, whoever got this, right? People at my old firm are very, very good at this. So I'm sure that people got involved into this halt, you know, and, and then they're kind of kicking it out, kicking it out here. It's the headline, billion, that, right? but the headline, yeah, 2 billion, right? And if you look at the market cap of this stock, it's it was 1.4 billion before that news yeah yeah so so, and so 2 billion is not that big of a move usually you know usually it's going to be a, a massive a massive premium right like yeah, in terms of dollar value the, the the premium's big but in terms of like market cap it it wasn't that big a move right so now and i think now the market cap wherever it's trading now is like 1.85 or 1.9 billion um all right so 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 now you're just thinking to yourself, well, you have to think to yourself, well, what what are the probabilities that this is really going to get bought out for 2.5 billion or 3 billion? Like, so so who's going to come? Who is going to come in and buy Vizio? Right? They, they just they make discount cheap TVs, right? And a lot of them are sold at Target or excuse me, Walmart or Sam's Clubs or Costco, right? Like, you know, and, th- and that's where like when you see news plays that kind of like up gap limit up and then up again and then they start trading it's because the smart people the whales know or think that well that's undervaluing the company because usually within these first five minutes you know you can get you get a bunch of press releases you get some analysts coming out and saying something so 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 you you know if you search twitter or if you subscribe to new services like you can find something where someone's going to come out and say something like all right, they should take this, right? And and what else is going to come in? What else is going to factor into this? Um, you know, it, yeah, their market cap may be 1.5 billion, 1.8 billion, but do they have? Let's see, uh, what's their? Uh, sorry, let me see. Like they might have a lot of, you know, I, I'm just trying to find, I'm trying to find the numbers real quick. I just didn't prepare for this this part of it, but. Other things that, you know, I know that people, when they trade these merger and acquisition type things, like, is there a lot of debt involved, right? Like, so they get, just because the market cap's 2 billion, they might have 500 million in debt, right? So that's going to depress the price as well. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, for me, I, for me, I think those are the other factors that I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking about. And then when, when I'm, if I'm, say I miss this trade and I, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, kind of think of it from from your perspective right and and you know because i'm a little more technical like you um all right up down you know and you tried here i get that i probably would have tried here too you know if i wasn't really in tune with like all right what's the market cap what's the offer um and all those things like you know up in 11 11 seems like a whole number breakout maybe you could maybe you can get that next dollar yeah. move right that's what but I was be, kind of. But because this yeah, candle, that's what I was. Uh, because this candle is so wide, right? So it's, you know, say this candle was actually, you know, actual full candle, but I see the volume's low. So maybe, maybe, maybe it opened at like three eleven fifty. So it really only traded for twelve seconds. You know what I mean? Or ten seconds before the next candle started trading. Does that make sense? Yeah, that was uh, something like that. It was very fast. Yeah. So. For me, like I don't like trading out of these first minute halts anymore just because I don't really know how what am I risking here? Like, you know, and we've talked about this before on the side. Like, if you say you buy eleven, I think you really have to risk ten because that's the prior that's the whole candle, right? How can you risk eleven and then stop yourself out at ten ninety or ten eighty or ten seventy, like without really seeing that or have having any evidence that there was support or buyers there? 
you know, right? You're, you're trying to just play pure momentum, unless you're really going to play pure momentum and scalp it where, all right, I'm going to look for pure momentum through 11. It went to 1130-ish, right? And as soon as it comes back through 11, though, I have to be out because I'm just trying to play the quick price action uh, momentum, you know, and you could have done it that way. And then after that, you know, maybe I'm looking for a candlestick setup, but like, but this doesn't look clean to me. This looks choppy. Like sellers obviously came in, they're strong. And, and, you know, like even this, it's like, it's got like that wedge look to it. It doesn't have like a, you know, a kind of a rounding bottom or like a, any kind of strength to it. Um, for me, I, I'd almost prefer to kind of go up a little bit higher and kind of flag so you can kind of see more price action and kind of just get a feel for what are people really playing and trying to do here. As soon as it, as soon as it breaks below this opening price though, it's kind of like a no, no trade for me. Um, just because that means the sell, the sellers to me post this very small, quick gap up on smaller volume are now in control. Right. So as you know, as we just talk about this, like, so 1025 is kind of my inflection point, point in the sand, um, where I'd, where I'd want to consider long or short and, you know, and, and then you're watching this, you know, maybe you're seeing this, all right, you know, one little one minute flag where you can risk 15, 20 cents. But again, because I have that 1025 line in the sand and now at this point, now the stock's traded for 20, 30 minutes and we're, you know, we're approaching the close, like is it really going to squeeze more? Like obviously now all the merger arbitrage people, all the algorithms, all the HFTs, they're coming, they're coming in and, and really kind of futzing around with this, the options market makers, whoever's involved, like, you know, it's more likely than not that it's probably going to just stay at 10. Right. And and then, so, so th this would be no trade for me now too. So it, it, should, it would be um, an avoid for me f at this point for the rest of the day. Yeah. I think I got does, attached does that make sense? to it. Just uh, yeah, no, it does make sense. I think I got attached to the trade um, after I missed it. I mean, I stopped out of the first trade at something like around ten. Yeah, exactly, the bottom of that one minute candle because I I knew it was wide, but I knew if I just didn't stop out before that, if I stopped out before that, I'm like technically I'm like I'm in no man's land, so I need to at least give it that. But I think all the trades after didn't really need to, to happen uh, it was just about uh, just trying because i was like i was really leaning into the, the level two and it seems like they were somebody like you know like you know when you you start focusing too much on something you see what you want to see and that was just mainly it so yeah you get you get that ton you get that tunnel vision you know you, you and then you 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 create the setup out of nothing you're you're creating the setup because you want the setup to be there um you know, you're looking for you're looking for your own confirmation bias, basically. Pretty much. So I found it, and I was able to take some more losses on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So welcome to trading. It, that's okay. You know, it, it it yeah. It's welcome to trading. That's that's the reality of trading. People take losses. You know, people don't people don't win all the time. Um, you know, people don't people don't win, and we don't. I don't have a Lambo, so and and I don't think you do either. Not yet. So. Not yet. I don't think it's gonna ever come like trading like that. But it's fine. So, uh, maybe, maybe if you catch, maybe, maybe if you catch it pre halt, you know, then you can get the Lambo. Yeah. I mean, it would have been a really, really nice trade. I think I was, it wasn't halted yet. I was really into the halt trying to get in and I couldn't get like a field or something like that. And then I sent you the imbalance showing like such a high price on it or like whatever clearing price it was. I was like, damn. And I think I even more fumbled into it because I was waiting the whole day or like even more than that, like months to finally trade like a good breaking news it happened and i missed it so i was like so frustrated nope yeah the, the biggest thing about breaking news is that people are putting out prs all the time right there's always news and as long as you stay focused on it if it's some you know a trade that you know a lot of people like to make yeah you know, because you can get these quick massive moves um you know it, it's just something you have to keep keep at and, and keep watching keep set people set alerts news alerts for certain market caps, certain floats, certain high short interests on purpose, knowing that those things are, are going to tend to make the biggest moves. Sorry for the quick interruption, but if you have questions that you'd like us to answer for the next show, don't forget to leave them down in the comment section. And I'll also link all the best tools for day trading in the description. So don't forget to check that out. 
let's get back to it. So like I mentioned, uh, I haven't traded like the breaking news really, except for a couple pre-market PR because I was on vacation or holiday trading, whatever you want to call it, for about a month and a half. And I was on a laptop and I kind of figured out that traveling and trading wasn't really for me. I mean, if it's only for a day or two, I can limit myself to only trading the best setup or what would have the best odds. But I just couldn't get myself really focused or or the loss hurt even more for some reason. Like on vacation, taking losses really ruined my day compared to taking losses when I'm home. And I decided after I guess the second week of being on vacation to just just not even trade. Like don't even like... I would still come in and like, you know, do my thing, check a few things, but I was like really about not clicking, not taking a trade. I couldn't get myself focused. I couldn't be in the zone. Like Wi-Fi was good, but it was just, I was like sketch out about something not working out and so on and so forth. So I decided to give up on that. And the next time I'll travel, I'll just accept that I'll time it for a moment that I just don't want to trade. Like, so because um, I know you've been on holidays also. And were you trading or you decided to actually put it aside? Either or, right? I, I think that that's, it's still, the answer is going to be personal for everyone. Like I know people that they like to go on vacation and like me, I I, I prefer to log in every single day. Like you, you know, I, I'd prefer to log in every day and still have some pulse on the market. Like even if I'm not trading, at least spend 20, 30, 40 an hour, like monitoring a couple positions that I have. Right. And, and, you know, we're going to talk about a couple of things right now. Like if, are you a day trader? Are you a swing trader? Are you a, you know, what's your trading style and the trading style, like that scalper one minute where you have to focus mentality for me, it doesn't work on a laptop. Um, you know, and obviously you see those social media warriors who are out there trading on a laptop. So go like, oh, just paid for my vacation on this quick scalp in 15 minutes and then I'm done. Right. Like, okay. It works. It works for some people, right? It just, it just it just works for some people. But I think that the reason that you have vacation and that people need to go on vacation is so that you can disconnect, right? You, everyone needs that disconnect. Um, and recently, I was in traveling in Asia, and the market was opening at ten o'clock at night, and it was just you know I would try. I I logged in and but I and I did my thing. I I watched for thirty minutes, and kind of just went to bed. Um, and I missed a lot of things and I missed a lot of the breakout move that happened in early January. And, you know, for a while, it really bothered me. <laughs> you know, it still bothers me that I missed those not seemingly easy breakouts, but um, as someone who prefers to go with the trend and it was a sector that I was watching and focusing on to miss that really was frustrating, um, you know, but I have to live with it. I made my decisions and um, I got to go on a, go have a great holiday. Uh, I eventually just stopped logging in because what was the point at that point? I didn't want to chase. I didn't want to feel those emotions that we talk about um, and it, have it affect my trading basically. But I'm all for logging in, you know, in my old firm, I didn't have the ability to trade, up, you know, abroad. Like it, and it, it gave me and people such FOMO, right? Oh my gosh, like I can never go on vacation because what if something happens, right? And that's how we were kind of, I don't know, taught to think, but that was like the mentality of the floor. Like what if something else happens and someone makes $50,000 or $100,000 or a million dollars, right? Whatever the number is, like, and then here I was on vacation, right? And and then I, I missed that amazing opportunity that everyone else capitalized capitalized on um, just because I was on vacation at this time and, and it made you not want to take vacation, you know, and you, there was no remote access, you know, they wanted everyone to come in on, onto the trading floor and, you know, COVID changed that for my friends and some have gone, you know, to other places besides New York city. But now for me, like when I left, one of the things I wanted to do was be able to trade. I wanted to be able to go on vacation and really kind of see like, all right, if my setup happens, you know, now that I have been able to really define my setups, if I, if my setup happens and it happens within the, thir the, the first 30 minutes or an hour of the day based on where I'm located, right? So for me, like if I go to the West Coast to go skiing, for example, you know, and the market opens at 630, 
but the mountain doesn't open until 9 30 you know i great i can trade the morning you know i can trade the morning and i can kind of you know before everyone else is awake have some coffee at least monitor if something happens great i take it if not all right i shut it down i'm going to go skiing for the day uh, the other thing that you know to what you were just saying about how it ruining your day on vacation whenever i trade on vacation i always decrease my risk size right us trading on vacation is our own degenerate nature to just be polite about it right we're you know we're, we're looking for action right like everyone wants to pay for the vacation while they're away especially if you're trading for PL like income if it's your main source of income you know you don't you don't want to feel like you're going on vacation and then you're also missing another opportunity it's not like i we get vacation days um you know do you try to try, time your vacations around slower periods but you never know right so i, I think that you know, if you go on vacation, you know, I just lower my risk. And then, and if I make what would normally be like a half hour or a quarter hour, great. You know, who cares? Like it, that's fine. It's, it's always better to make something than nothing is my thought. And it's always better. It's also always better to be flat than down a lot and then have it really ruin your day or your, your whole vacation unnecessarily. Yeah. So I, I guess, I guess it depends on how long you're on vacation and also the time frame, the time zone, the strategy, because I'm trying to really focus more on like news trade. You're just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting until something, you know, with news comes out. And while on vacation, it was just so painful versus if you know your setup comes around a certain time, you can kind of manage. I guess, yeah, it's very dependent on your style. I didn't think of it like that. If, yeah, if you're focused on more trend trading or whatever you want to call it, swing trading, day trading, but it's very like setup based, you know, at what time these setup are going to come. So, you know, you're going to at least be done by, by noon. So you have the rest of your day really to, to enjoy at least if you don't want to sit around. Yeah. I mean, and even for news trading, you know, like you, sh you know, and as you, if it's something that you start to focus more on, like you'll realize that. You know, take away like the that breaking news trade in in during the day in v, VZIO yesterday. A lot of the best news trades happen in the pre market, right? And, and if even if you're on vacation, you just set yourself up for 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m., right? And, and like that's when all the PRs come out. Like mo almost all PRs, if you look at the timing, they come out on the hour on the quarter hour and on the bottom of the hour, right? 7, 7, 15, 7, 30, 7, 45, not so much 7, 45 or 8 o'clock and then 8 o'clock, right? So, all right. And, and what, and you don't have to worry about things like VZIO getting halted, right? So you can, you can have a little more leeway to chase a little bit, right? Like not that I'm advocating chasing, make sure you size your trade properly to your own risk parameters. Um, but right, like you, like you don't have to worry about missing, you know, it, like you were saying, you were trying to figure out the ticker symbol and then, but if VZIO was still trading in the pre-market, maybe it was at, maybe it would have been at 850 and you could have bought a, a smaller size because you were buying a little bit higher, but you could still have participated um, in that, right? Uh, you know, so th I would say that those are some of the things and then you get your whole day, right? Because the news trade during the day is such a specific trade and then you, you might miss it because it got halted because it's so fast. And then what, like you said, like you just, you wasted your whole day missing, missing that news trade anyway, you know, un, you know, unnecessarily, or just, just because it was too fast for you to react to, right. Because it got halted. So I, I guess I could have really focused on the, the pre and then maybe the post, if I was there for the post uh, market. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then you, you're, you still get to enjoy your vacation and, and you still get to enjoy your time. And, you know, you don't, you're not feeling like you're spending the whole day there. Um, and anything that does happen, you can journal it, playbook it, and you can kind of replay what's happening and what's going on. And, 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 you know, and really still feel like you have a pulse on what's happening versus just totally being blind when, when you get back. Yeah. Cause that's definitely the case, uh, this week, uh, even with that PR on, on B, BMR, it was a really good PR pre-market, they announced that they were going to partner with NVIDIA and um, that was like a really, like it was a massive trade and I do have alerts for that, but I, I was just so, so lost trying to figure out my, my hotkey on that keyboard, trying to figure out where to put my platform now, like all on my screen. It was just, uh, yeah, 
So that was the trade. So it came on over here so much time to actually buy that PR. And for sure, you can expect that big of a move, but it never got back to kind of the the reference price or any close to it. It just popped and it went sideways, sideways, sideways. So if you, and I have a few examples of, of this specific trade of, uh, I had CGen, it was like, this one was a biotech, but it announced that it partnered with Gilead, which was like a massive biotech. So a micro cap partnering with a massive biotech on an exclusive licensing deal. That was good. There was uh, CCCC, which was a, they announced uh, another licensing deal with Merck, which was something like similar to that. There was also, I don't I have a couple of examples. There was FRGT, another small cap that announced that, they put it funny on the PR, this one, as I remember it was, that they signed a deal for their trucking business with Amazon Mexico, but technically it was just that they, they just renewed the contract. Like it was, it was like not a new thing. It was just like, uh, they're extending it for like one year, which, and they made so go like another 200%. But like the, the finding that news was just easy. Look for PR on small cap that are partnering with like a major company. And I have that playbook. And then I, like, I saw it, like, by the time I figured out that stock or site, it was probably, like, already up 500%. I was like, God damn, what was I? So that, maybe if I, I did trade a bit, I would have been a, at least a more in tune with um, with the market. I, I think that's probably the benefit of at least still logging in, clocking in a couple of hours instead of not even looking. But, you know, and everyone's different, right? Everyone's going to be different. Everyone has to find their balance, right? Like, if you, do you have a family? Do you have, you know, are you going by yourself? Are you with your friends? You know what are you what do you have scheduled for the day or the, or the vacation are you just is it a beach vacation or is it something where you're doing a lot of uh touring and exploring right like everyone's you know every vacation is different so I, every, everything has to have different parameters um kind of set you know your own parameter set to it uh, yeah makes uh makes total sense and that's going to bring it to the next topic which is yesterday i sent you a ticker that made a big move and it was on a PR that happened during the day. Like it wasn't like this crazy PR, like this Visio, but it was a, like, I thought the PR was BS and I didn't have any alerts for it because it's not something that I, I thought would make something move, but I did have a lot of FOMO because I missed the trade because it was a news trade. And when I, when I went to set up some alerts on it and I was talking with you, you said like, uh, be careful when you're trying to playbook these things because sometimes maybe this one did make a big move, but was it like was it because of the news? Or it was just something that you know they had in mind. Or if this news comes out again, is it gonna make the ticker move like this or not? Right. So that's like the news was about um, they canceled an offering or the, uh, repurchase, repurchase some shares, like something very non non special, like. Okay, so it looks like the news actually was they anticipate utilizing a previously authorized repurchase plan. Um, Even if the PR is, is BS, would you still consider taking the trade? Because the setup seemed to be pretty good on the technical side, I, I think. You know, and, and this is what I was saying to you, right? Um, you know, my point yesterday was sometimes there's a lot of fluffy prs right and i think this this might come down to you know knowing the company right there's there's a lot of companies out there that are always putting out fluffy prs they're always posting fluffy things on twitter and sometimes depending on the market that you're in they run and sometimes they don't and and, and it's kind of random you know are you in a bull market are are there a lot of people on twitter that all of a sudden seem to be pumping it and and hyping it and talking about it um I think that the reason that this ran is because its float, when I look, is 2.8 million, and the sh it's 13% short. You know, but looking at the PR as I read it now, they're only repurchasing. Well, I guess they're repurchasing. I guess they're repurchasing 680,000. Um, well, they plan. They plan to. They're not doing it. They they plan to which 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 is what twenty twenty five percent of the float um, based on what the numbers I just mentioned. Okay, I mean I I get I guess I guess that you can you know it's a, it's a, it's essentially a, a self fulfilling short squeeze right like they 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 created their own short squeeze by you know putting out a PR that they're going to repurchase their shares or maybe repurchasing their shares 
you know, and, and like I was saying to you, is like, do you have evidence that other people putting this out on a small cap is it definitely going to, is it definitely going to go up? Is it definitely going to go up, a, you know, a hundred percent? Like that was, that was, you know, you were mentioning that that was like really your FOMO about it, but it went up a hundred percent. Right. It, again, everything is just, everything has to be kind of relative to like what you were seeing at the time, you know, and, and it's, it's so easy to like look in hindsight and say, this was so easy, right? This was so easy. Like, oh my gosh, look at this little cup and flag, cup and handle flag, blah, blah, blah. And it just went up a hundred percent from there. But like people, you people, I mean, this is, this is, should be a topic for another, another day, but people need to start really focusing on what was your mindset like here, right? Like what was your mindset here before it even happened, right? Like, okay, you get like a, a 10 cent move, 25% ish, right? There's my math right there. 20% ish. Um, you get a 20% move here. Okay. And it, and then, and then it retraces. 50% and then, and then it kind of, you know, it starts to curl back up. Okay. You know, and, and I'm just using five minute candles just as a, as a bigger proxy here instead of just the one minute, but you know, as a, say you're trading on five minute candlesticks, like if you're getting long here at 55 cents, 54 and a half, and are you really risking like five cents? Are you, ris are, re are you risking 10% here? Right. If you're risking 10% here, five cents, like, what's your three, four, five hour trade? You know, I, I guess you're looking for a 75 cent move, a move to 75, 80 cents, maybe a dollar, just, you know, get that dollar holler move. You know, it, it, it all comes down to like, you know, it all comes down to like really understanding the fundamentals, like seeing, seeing that there's only 2.8 million in shares of float, seeing that they're buying back 600,000 shares, like, all right, it, that that's significant where like, you, you could get a strong move, but then to, to that, right? Like obviously, you know, and this is where people who use dilution tracker and, and look at a lot of SEC forums that are a lot smarter than I am because it's not something that I could, I really wanted to kind of figure out and put into my playbook, right? Either people thought it was BS or they just didn't believe it, whatever, whatever it is or there's something else about an offering or ATM or some, something else out there. Otherwise it would have, it would have stayed right. Like why, why would it go all the way up and then all the way back down and like fully round trip if it wasn't really significant. Right. And, and I, and I can't remember who said it, but you know, there's someone on, I want to say social media, social, you know, fin twit that I, I followed it. I can't remember who, or maybe it was in a mentor, but, like we're only renting them. We're only renting the names, right? We're, we're like as shorter term traders and not investors. Like we're just, we're in the rental business. We're not in, we're not in like the, the owning business. So, you know, and this is kind of where like volume and, and technicals, you, this is where you can kind of get your edge, right? You can take a trade here, but like, you know, again, don't let, don't let the hindsight of just seeing it happen give you the expectation that the next time that exact same PR comes out for another company that you're going to see that same move, right? You, you still want to make sure you see some sort of, you know, proper risk to reward, um, set for a trade. Yeah. So I guess I could have still took the trade as a trade, like a technical trade, but I can't take really that trade on the news, except I'm just saying, oh, there's, we're in a hot market. There's a lot of momentum. Maybe this one can have like a push, but like, you know, it's, it's a big move that it did, but I can't really game plan for finding news that make this, I guess, on this one. I, I think if there's a way for you to kind of look back and kind of see like that a similar PR that's come out, I'm not sure, if, you know, you have that ability to reverse engineer it and just, you know, look at float under I don't know, make it big and just make it big, make float under a hundred million share, share repurchase program. Um, and, and then just, you know, then you reverse engineer the moves that way and see, all right, well, maybe, maybe, the, maybe it's a bigger thing than I thought it was. Right. Maybe stocks are actually making 10 to hundred percent moves. Um, especially when the stock's under 20, right. Or under 10. Um, and that, and that particular PR seems to come out. Um, you know, I, I that, that was like a kind of like a, like you said, a, a unique PR that, that I hadn't really seen before, you know, they're reinitiating a research repurchase plan, but you know, maybe they got some funding and, and maybe people were 
worried that they were going to drop an offering, right? You know, uh, again, things that are probably all in the filings that I just don't know the answers to, just because that that particular trade's not in my playbook. All right, no, I think it makes sense because um, I'm there's so many moves like this when I I look back at like pre market like. Um, pre-market stocks that are moving or making like 100% moves, sometimes there's just no news. A lot of the time there's no news. So I'm like, well, how am I supposed to find these things? I can, yeah, I can find it on a scanner, but why, like, I always have a hard time buying stuff with no news because I'm like, why is something up 100% on the news? Like no filings, like really nothing, no tweet, like zero. And it's always like, uh, I mean, the setup is nice, the stock looks, and it, it sometimes it, it does move higher. And I think it's probably because people are shorting it just because there's no news and it's up a lot, which would be an ideal short, right? Like, you know, it's going to go down at some point, like, because there's no news. Well, that's what, that's what you're assuming, right? Like, you, you never know, you know, and, and as I, you know, what, what I've learned over the years is someone always knows or someone always knows something or something's always happening, right? A lot of those things are are paid pump paid pumps right like you can you know are they is there a paid promotion going on is is you know if you look at the filings there may not be a filing now but was there a previous filing that said that they had to um get their share price over a certain level for a certain number of days so that they can drop an offering right or so so that an insider can can sell right so those are other things that you know yeah, there's not going to be a PR and offering that day, but there are little rules like if a CEO wants to share sell like 10% of the of his holdings, right? He the average volume needs to be big enough that he's not more than like 20% of the volume for the day or or something like that. There's some kind of rule like that. Yeah. So so if there's if there's a small cap that's only averaging 50,000 shares a day, and, and the guy wants to dump 50,000 shares a day that means some market maker or some promotion or whoever it is like they're it's probably most likely a market maker an underwriter right where they're offering they're going to offer shares to these people like a penny or five pennies it's like put pump up the stock volume to 250,000 shares a day for the next 10 days so that i can sell my 50k shares you know and then then we'll exercise your warrants or rights or whatever like that and then you can and you dump it right like there's that whole game with those small caps like that and i think that that's why sometimes they they run and then and then they eventually roll over once that you know manipulation or whatever you want to call it is kind of done are you familiar with market making and like how these contract works uh, out of curiosity because i don't know if they can do they hire actually market makers to just generate volume on their stock or or it's like they do it through promotion and like whatever they want to do it I'm not an expert on this by any means. Um, I, you know, it's just from, this is just from talking to some people and, and some of it's listen. there's a, there's actually a really good podcast, uh, confessions of a market maker. And the guy, the one guy always talks about how he was a market maker and he was paid to keep the RSI of a stock and the price of a stock up for so long. And he said he was holding so many shares, but because they were trying to, insiders were trying to sell it and he was just holding it up he was holding it up like, he's never mentioned what the stock is or anything like that or but, but you know but he's talked about how he talks about how he had to do that so people could literally do this this exact process yeah i listened to that podcast it's actually pretty good um i don't know if they had any recent one but yeah he he uses, I know he uses it a lot like VWAP or, or not like can some kind of VWAP because he sees like market in different structure because he was a market maker. Some interesting thoughts on this, but it doesn't really apply to my trading. Yeah, me either. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for watching this episode. If you enjoy, like and subscribe. Also, if you have any question that you'd like us to answer on the next episode, leave them down below. 